All right, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I'm so excited to have you. And, you know, from the PRSA Sierra Nevada chapter, we want to thank you, everybody, thank everybody for being here today and welcome you to this event, the special event about uh, reaching the Latino community beyond Hispanic Heritage Month, which is, which is a very important message that uh, we would like to share today. Um, if we can have everybody just think if you have it on, um, turn, uh, sorry, turn your speaker over to mute, that would be great. And my name is Yvette Contreras. I haven't even introduced myself, right? I am uh, the VP of Programming for the PRSA Sierra Nevada chapter. And we have a great, three great speakers today, and I'll be moderating this important conversation about reaching the Latino community. And um, our three speakers will be, be speaking on you know, very important topics. First of all, diversity and inclusion. And we're starting off with that topic because we think it's you know, very important that when we're having this discussion, when we are reaching this audience, that we make sure we have people who have insight into the community. And um, all these great speakers are you know, native Nevadans, um, long-time Nevadans, and so we have, you know, a really great um, grasp of what our Latino community looks like through our research, through our education, but also because we've lived it. We've lived this community um, since day one. <laughs> um, we also have another speaker who will be, you know, answering the question, which is, it, it, it does get a little complex, but um, there is, you know, um, information behind that will allow you to understand, is it Latino? Is it Latinx? Is it Hispanic? Um, and then third, we'll also have an example, there was a, a campaign that was recently launched around COVID-19, uh, the Latino um, uh, constituents in Southern Nevada regarding COVID-19. And it really does incorporate a lot of the must-haves when it, when it you know, comes to reaching to this audience. And you know, before we get to that, I do wanna pass it over, the mic over to Lucy, who will go over a couple little housekeeping um, items for all of us today. Take it away. Thank you, Yvette. Hi, I'm Lucy Rodolia. I'm the Member Relations VP for PRSA Sierra Nevada. Um, just a few technical things for the webinar today. Um, you are able to unmute yourselves if you need to, um, but we ask that you remain muted through the entire presentation and we're gonna address a Q&A at the end. So you are either able to um, raise your hand if you have a question or you can submit a question anytime throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Chat is also enabled so you can send comments. You have the ability to toggle between all panelists and attendees or just panelists in the chat. Um, so if you want to share with everyone attending versus if you want to just share with the panelists, that's up to you. But um, we ask that you put your comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A feature if possible. I'll still be monitoring the chat for questions as well, but um, you know, I, I think it makes the most sense to try and use the Q&A feature so we can. Oh, Sierra says as a webinar, we can't unmute ourselves. <laughs> Thanks, Sierra. Um, I don't know why that didn't work, but um, anyway. I guess that takes care of that. I'll be reading through the questions at the end for um, the Q&A when the panelists address your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and that's it then. I guess that's, oh, one more thing. Um, you can click the speaker view to see each panelist who's currently speaking. And Yvette will have the presentation up in her shared screen, but you should be able to see who is speaking plus the presentation on the same screen. Or you can use the gallery view and you'll see all five of our videos at once. Um, so it's really up to you if you wanna to toggle between gallery view and speaker view. But I think that's it for housekeeping. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lucy, for that. And you know, I also wanna you know, introduce myself a little bit more. I shared my name, but also a little bit about my background. I am uh, a native Nevadan. I was born in Truckee just because Incline Village didn't have a maternity ward. Or I would have been, you know, battle born as well. Um, I grew up in Northern Nevada. I went to UNR um, during college. I worked for Channel Four, um, so I am, you know, award-winning former award-winning journalist turned Latino outreach uh, public relations uh, professional. Um, I worked in Univision, Telemundo here in Reno, as well as in Las Vegas, and I did also collaborate with a couple of national uh, national networks, 
on, you know, mostly on, on unfortunate stories. Like if you guys might remember the Sparks Middle School shooting and um, the Las Vegas massacre. And in 2018, um, I decided to kind of pave my own way. And I turned over to be um, uh, in the more the PR side of, of things, um, you know, to expand on what, what I've learned. And I was always on that receiving side from all the PR people calling me, you know, sending me pitches. And I was, you know, and, and it was a lot of missed opportunities there where I was like, you know, this could have been pitched a little bit different. It would have been great for the Spanish uh, speaking community. And, you know, I saw that, you know, that, that little void. And, and I think it was a great opportunity for me to come back to home with just Reno and use that. So I've been work, I've worked with uh, um, presidential candidates, congressional candidates, um, and also with sports organizations, uh, Reno Aces, uh, Miss USA. And um, so it's, it's been, you know, been doing this for the last two years. And, you know, I, I love doing what I do because like I said, you know, I've researched it, lived it. Um, and so this, you know, I'm so happy that, you know, with when I brought this idea up to our chapter, they were so, you know, welcoming about the idea and our programming committee has really helped uh, put this event together for you guys today because, you know, the goal today is, um, you know, basically allow, give you that information so that you may, you know, lead with insight rather than with stereotypes when you're reaching the Latino community. And, you know, we're probably at all different levels of how much we know about the Latino community. And that's great. And that's important. And we also motivate, you know, help people have a more successful outreach plan or campaign, but also um, people who haven't yet reached out to this community to also feel empowered to do so. It's, you know, one out of four people in Northern Nevada are Latino and it's growing. And I, I will be, you know, surprised that you know, the, the last census was about 24, 28%. I wouldn't be surprised that that might grow once we get the 2020 census results. And it's definitely growing, it's thriving. Um, I was reading a really great data where it said that, um, in, 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 you know, nationally, Latinos are opening business uh, 50 times the rate of other demographics. So it's, you know, definitely growing and also um, when it comes to, you know, expanding their business. So, you know, without, you know, further ado now, I'm gonna share my screen and, I am gonna introduce you to our first speaker who is uh, Lizbeth Alvarez. So give me one moment, let me go ahead and share this. And I'm seeing there a message on the chat box, complete the census, yes, complete the census. <laughs> give me one moment here and then you guys are all look, look, can you see my screen, thumbs up? Perfect, okay. Oh my God, Lizbeth, um, you know, she's the bilingual uh, public relations coordinator. Um, during her time at UNR, she's led a group of four students on a one month campaign to raise awareness of lack of diversity and inclusion. And this is, you know, one of the things she'll be speaking about. Um, she also earned a national honorable mention and she was named AAF's Reno Outstanding Strategic Communication Student of the Year and followed by her earning a, cert a certificate in principles of of uh, public relations and something that you know that I uh, she was she allowed me to share with you guys was that she came to the U.S. when she was around eight years old and um, she was undocumented until she was 15 years old so for her going to college was like you know it's, it's not a possibility for me until um, you know thankfully when she was 15 she was um, able to now see that that's a possible future um, and it all happened because she had a mentor somebody in her life um, introduced her to PR at, at a very young age. And this is why, you know, she is now um, working for KPS3. And, you know, she's very one of the very few uh, PR professionals in this industry. So, Lizbeth, um, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, let's talk about a little bit, a little insight on what our demographics look like here in Northern Nevada. And then let's talk about diversity and inclusion. Hi everyone, thank you Yvette for the intro. Uh, I'm Lizbeth and uh, like Yvette said, um, I work at KPS3 and for the last couple of years um, before working there and after, I focused a lot, my, uh, my efforts on researching about the Latino community uh, in the state, locally in Washoe County, in Reno and how that compares to uh, the US. So I'm, I'm gonna be really excited to share all these insights with you. Um, Everything is from projected data that's gonna be coming up with the census. Like they said, please fill it out. Um, and uh, as well as some primary research that I've been doing the last couple of years.
So to start off with the Nevada demographics, 28% uh, of the state is Latino or Hispanic, and it really is the second largest ethnic group, both in the nation and in our state. Um, the median age for U.S. born, you know, in their teens, more Gen Z and foreign born, 41, so a very uh, young uh, generation X. 76% uh, speak in other language other than English at home, most likely Spanish. That's the second language that's most used. Um, and over 40% of K through 12 students are Latino in the state. So we truly are the emerging majority. Um, sorry, I got a poll. Um, <laughs> the emerging majority and um, I think it's really interesting because we are kind of following the footsteps of what the national data is showing. Um, and so is Washoe County. So in Washoe County, 25% um, are Latino. Um, you know, in Reno, it's like 25%, Sparks, 25, 26%. And it kind of just goes around, uh, you know, from the 20 to 30% all in Northern Nevada. Uh, almost 80% are Mexican, they have Mexican origin. And the reason why uh, this is so important is that, um, and Diego, uh, J. Diego is gonna touch on this a little bit more, but you know, the country of origin is super important whenever you're doing any sort of research in this community and in other um, ethnic groups. So it is important to know that in Northern Nevada, at least, uh, there are almost 80% of you know, Latinos who are Mexican. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that's a different type of Spanish that they speak in other, you know, Spanish speaking countries, different cultural norms, uh, rituals, you know, religion, it kind of plays a little part in everything that's important when you're doing your research, uh, psychographic, demographics, um, as well as age. 40% uh, of K through 12 students are Latino. Um, and this is taken right, of, right out of uh, the Washoe County School District data. So it keeps increasing. Um, and there are, you know, representatives of the population in teachers that continues to increase. So that touches a little bit upon of, you know, who the role, model, role models are when you're growing up and who do you aspire to, to teach and to mentor. Um, and we are also the second most diverse school district in Nevada, of course, followed by Clark. Um, so I think that that's super interesting. Um, it's just going to keep increasing from here and it's only going to get higher as the years go by. And I think that we're going to get to know a little bit more uh, than projected, you know, data from the next census. Um, so some local insights that um, I, you know, that I've discovered over the last couple of years is that Yes, um, you know, Mexican or of Mexican descent, um, but 50% have no preference of the word Hispanic or Latino. Um, and I'm gonna just kind of leave it at that a little bit uh, for you to think over. Um, since most of them are Mexican, that's, that's how a lot of people are identifying. And a lot of young Latinos do feel like they have this neither nor here from there mentality. Um, they don't feel completely too American, they don't feel completely Latino or Mexican or from where their country of origin is. Uh, so really culture is key when targeting any of these demographics, uh, focusing on what's important to their culture, what their family values are, um, you know, reaching beyond language. So they are, uh, the Latinos here in Northern Nevada are, you know, they engage more with campaigns and with ads that properly incorporate the culture. And this goes completely beyond code switching. It's not just, you know, switching a photo uh, to have it look more inclusive or have different age groups or have, you know, um, people that look a little bit different than what you would normally expect in an ad. Um, but they do want the cultural references uh, appropriately attached um, so that it kind of like reminds them of what they're living at home and they feel that personal connection and they're building that connection with the brand and the ad. Um, older Latinos uh, in comparison to younger Latinos they do prefer more Spanish uh, and full, fully translated or trans-created um, advertisements and campaigns 
as to younger Latinos, they just prefer to have more of the cultures because they're tied to their roots, but maybe not so much the language unless you're attaching a little bit of code switching. Um, and something that I always advise is to always transcreate and it's always preferred over direct translation because a lot of the message can be completely lost um, if you don't focus on the culture behind it. And I'm gonna dive a little bit uh, into DEI and this all fits in with, you know, speaking to your audiences as well as internally with your teams um, is to avoid any type of jargon and be direct. Um, learning the different subgroups is super important instead of just categorizing or stereotyping an entire group and um, kind of like the Latino community. And although some conversations can be a little bit intimidating, uncomfortable. Um, they truly are rewarding, um, not just internally, but also when you're speaking to your audiences. If you reach a point where you are comfortable to speak on a topic and learn and ask questions with your team, it truly is going to reflect on the work that you do for your clients. Um, so one thing that you specifically have to focus on is hiring for diversity. Um, in the Latino community, it could be that it helps you on in how you, you know, uh, write a specific strategy, a message, a social media post that might not be offensive to you, but that could be offensive to the person that's reading it that's in a specific subgroup of, of that ethnic or racial group. Um, the lack of diversity in your team, it will affect your clients either positively or negatively. Um, based upon you choosing trans creation over, you know, translation and thinking that, you know, posting that copy to Google Translate and just kind of going with the flow uh, will not affect your brand, but it, it truly does make a, a difference and having someone to guide you through the process will make it a lot easier for you. So how can you strengthen the internal culture? Um, one of the things that I, I really, really always advise is to invest in mentorship. Um, for me personally, like Yvette, uh, let you know, I wouldn't have known about the PR industry if it wasn't for my mentors and the people that I met through college. But it wasn't until I was almost graduating out of college that I, I realized that this was truly an option for me. Um, the fields that you focus on more are the ones where you feel represented. And if we don't have representation, then the 90%, you know, mark will never go down in PR and it will always be a primarily white dominated field. Um, and that's truly going to affect us as we continue to change in our demographics in the nation and here locally. Um, offering uh, educational experiences for diverse employees, it really does bridge the gap that is lost um, in academia and throughout their experiences. Um, it, it can kind of bring awareness as to where they lack some skills, but where they can gain them through um, either a webinar or an online class or an in-person class, if that ever happens again. Um, and then also taking a stand and uh, establishing realistic goals. Um, I know that a lot of the questions that I get is, you know, the pool of applicants, um, they're necessarily not diverse. And how do you recruit more, you know, diverse professionals if there is not very many here in Northern Nevada? And I think that it, it truly is important to know that it, it all starts with mentorship and, you know, PRSA offers that opportunity where you can mentor you know students in general and students of color and i know that that's something that the student organization is trying to focus on mainly by educating and reaching out to the high schools that have a high population of uh, diverse students another thing that has personally helped um, us at kps3 is personality tests and I had no idea what they were until I started working there. And I, <laughs> I quickly learned that it really truly is important 
uh, to know the strengths and weaknesses, communication skills from your peers, and truly know how to reach someone so that they can get better at uh, a skill that they're lacking and how to reward um, the good communication skills or something that you can learn from your peers. And some, I want to touch on some of the characteristics of multicultural PR practitioners and specifically Latinos. Um, there's a really big difference uh, in the cultural sensitivity based upon the experiences that we've had growing up. Um, although there is a lot that you can learn through, you know, extensive education about the field and about the audience. Um, there is a difference of what you say, you know, what you think you said, what you intended to say, and it truly all can get lost um, if you don't have the background and if you have, don't have the experience uh, within that specific community. So there is a very big difference learning through experience and learning through education. And if your team isn't currently diverse right now, this doesn't mean that you can't learn how to target this demographic, but it would make a big difference to have someone guide you through the process to make it a little bit easier for you. Um, as we touched on before, you know, not all Spanish is the same. Code, code switching could be different in different parts of, you know, Spanish speaking countries. So it's really important to be able to connect directly with your audiences. Um, I've learned that after I'm speaking with a lot of people in focus groups, they truly open up a little bit more when they know that we have shared similar experiences. So when I start to share a little bit about myself, my background, they kind of feel represented in a way and are more open to being honest about, you know, what they like, what they don't like, what they see, and how they feel about these like very touchy topics. Um, and then overall, you know, having a Latino sort of advisor, PR practitioner to review and evaluate and advise on how to better reach and avoid mistakes, you know, confusion, negative undertones. Um, it can truly help you from making a silly mistake that someone who has the experience and who has the background could have noticed it. Um, in a matter of seconds and minutes, um, like this example here. So I couldn't go off without showing you guys to at least two examples of my favorite silly mistakes that I've seen around. Um, and the first one is of a concha or brioche like rolls that are perfect for like breakfast, um, that if anybody with a background could have instantly known that they were already making a mistake by categorizing this and columbusing, uh, as Twitter says, um, a term that and a, a pastry that we have had growing up and that is so common and that it, it truly, truly identifies us as a culture. Um, and the second is nopales, which I personally I uh, had to explain to a classmate once of that we, that we eat cacti and that it is totally normal and that it's not the new trend and that it's been happening for many, many years and that it's actually eaten by a lot of people who um, are in lower income and that it actually is really good. So I think that a lot of these mistakes could be avoided and it could represent your brand better, your entire company better, if you do have someone who has all this knowledge before something like this happens. Um, and it really all is tied down to, you know, identity and what you know. Um, and I think that is all. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Yvette. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you so much. Again, she is a PR coordinator at KPS3 here in Reno. So thank you so much uh, for all that information. And I also wanted to, you know, go on um, how important it is, you know, to have people within your organization that are able to give you that insight, right? Um, because it is a community that is beyond tacos and mariachis and all the stereotypes, right? It's, obviously, it's part of our community. It is, definitely is, and we love it. But if you really want to get in there, uh, into these communities, you really have to look into the culture. And 
um, we are speaking about how different the, within the Latino community is, with you know, changes by region, generations, um, and you know, it, the upbringing. It, it's, it's a community that's very, very diverse. But when you go into the culture, that's how you're able to reach to more Latinos. And so I wanted to share um, a couple examples of, um, that I've seen that I thought were, were really great, that really dug into that nostalgia. Um, you know, Latinos are very nostalgic people, you know, and um, we also do, um, you know, love our culture and think about our, our grandparents. And um, so let me show you what I have here. Go back to uh, where we were. One moment. So Ponle Acento was um, an initiative that uh, made, uh, Major League Baseball did. And but basically what they did was adding that accent back into that name, into your Latino name. So I'm going to show you this video, um, not all of it, just a little bit about it. But it was a really great uh, strategic way to reach out to Latinos, young and old, because accent is part of our, our the full culture. It doesn't matter if you're from Puerto Rico, from Colombia, Mexico, the accent is, they, we, you know, accent is part of us. And this is how you reach every, across, people across the board. It's an example. Many Hispanics in the U.S. lose part of their identity. They lose the accent marked on their name. Nor is this more evident than in Major League Baseball, where almost 27% of players are Hispanic. So in 2016, NLB set out to do something about it by speaking to a new generation of Hispanic fans and highlighting the role of Latinos in America's pastime. The idea? Put the accent back on the jerseys of Latino players, bringing this matter into the spotlight with the hashtag Ponle Acento or put the accent on it. A simple post by LA Dodgers superstar Adrian Gonzalez made the announcement public and challenged other players to join this movement, and they responded in a big way. The initiative quickly gained momentum. Ponle Acento connected with fans' sense of pride and became a movement in itself. Boxing champion Canelo Alvarez and celebrities like Mark Anthony, George Lopez, and others joined the campaign on their own accord. Latino actors even requested accents on their Walk of Fame stars and referenced hashtag Ponle Acento. It's even started to influence other major sports like the NBA. Then, in a bold move, Major League Baseball added the accent to their own logo during Hispanic Heritage Month. Ponle Acento Latino. Ponle Acento was a culture-changing 360 campaign reflecting everything Latinos contribute to the game. And of course, the media took notice. Said, Ponle Acento. So there's a quick little part um, that I wanted to share with you guys. And um, you know, resonates with people of, you know, Latinos across the board. Um, this one's kind of funny because I will say that Latinos, we love humor. We're very, <laughs> we really enjoy having a good time. And so, um, you know, sticking to the baseball theme here, um, the MLB also and the um, minor league baseball also, they, they had a Copa de Diversión, which was an initiative to reach out to, to Latinos. And so right now you're looking at a flying chancla. That's a sandal. So for many, it's like, what? It's flying sandal, like, <laughs> what is that? But if you talk to anybody in the Latino community, we know what the flying chancla is. And it's, um, it's not, it's basically based like a, hum, like a, you know, in memory of like our, our grandmas and our moms. And it's, it's not to, it's basically the way that, you know, a lot of Latinos are, are disciplined <laughs> and we're not advocating for child abuse, right? But um, it, it's something that you, you remember from your childhood and now when you're older and adult, you know, it, it brings out those memories and it, and it makes you laugh. So this actually was one of the best-selling caps, the best-selling um, uh, a gear that they, they, that they came out with. And why was that? It was because they were reaching into the culture and it was more than just like, um, than, than anything. And, and who would know about the Flying Chancla than obviously somebody who's lived um, the, the, the culture, right? And uh, for many, it's just a, a sandal, but in the hands of your mom or your grandma, that was a missile. <laughs> and so I um, just wanted to share those two campaigns. One of them, obviously, you know, reaching into that pride that Latinos have, um, getting that accent back in. And then this one's just bringing a little bit of, of humor into reaching out to this um, to the very diverse Latino uh, community. So now um, I would love to everybody introduce you to J. Diego uh, Sarasua. He is a coordinator in education research and outreach for the UNR Latino Research Center. Um, he serves also on the executive board um, as a communications chair for Latinx Pride, um, a nonprofit focused on empowering and embracing 
the Latinx LGBTQ plus um, youth. He also hosts a podcast called Daqui y Daya, which is from here and from there, which you know, Elizabeth talked about um, that experience, um, you know, where, where a lot of Latinos are feeling that they're in both, you know, kind of biculturalism. Um, and, you know, him um, having this podcast, you know, shows a lot of the journey that he went through and that many immigrants, children of immigrants, who look for that sense of belonging in both cultures and, and then embrace that biculturalism, um, you know, it's really important. Um, Jay Diego is also still continuing his studies. Uh, he's working on his master's degree as well um, of world literature and languages. And so we're so happy to have him here today. He is, I know they had a question on there about Latinx, Hispanic, Latino terms. Um, you know, what do we use? So she, he will dive into that and also on um, a couple other really important things on there, including Google Translate. Not your best friend, trust me. Right, Diego? <laughs> That's correct, Yvette. Thank you so much for having me here and thank you everybody who's taken the time out of the, the middle of your busy days, I'm sure, to really focus on the importance of our, our community, our growing community here in Northern Nevada, being the Latino community. Um, before I get too far into this, I wanna make sure my audio is okay. I saw something in the chat about maybe the audio being a little bit too low. So if I could just get a couple thumbs up or, or some nods. Um, I wanted to share first with you the mission of the Latino Research Center, and I'm sure it's going to resonate with a lot of your own missions of um, the institutes and the agencies that you're working at. Uh, the Latino Research Center um, at the University of Nevada serves as a nexus between the Latino community and the university. Our mission is to foster research, student achievement, faculty collaboration, advocacy, and outreach in a manner, of course, that better meets, uh, best meets the educational needs and goals of the state of Nevada, but also best honors the intellectual and cultural capital of the Latino presence in the state. And I know that that's the purpose of uh, all of you attending here is to gain more uh, understanding of the intellectual and cultural capital of the Latino presence in the state. So we'll move forward and uh, talk about what are these, uh, these pan terms, Hispanic, Latinx, Latino, um, what should we be using? Uh, what is the historical background of them? Um, so Latino actually refers to those coming from Latin America. It includes countries like Argentina, Mexico, and Cuba, uh, 20 countries total actually, and some territories like uh, U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. The term was first introduced by a Chilean politician uh, named Francisco Bilbao in 1856. And you could see the graph there and start recognizing some of those uh, countries in red that identify as Latino. If we were to talk about Hispanic, however, that actually means somebody coming from a Spanish speaking country. According to the Cervantes Institute, more than 4 million people are from Spanish speaking countries. However, and you might be surprised, only about 10% reside here in the United States. The term was actually first introduced in 1970 uh, by the U.S. Census and the U.S. government as a way to categorize all of the Spanish-speaking uh, residents here in the United States. However, while the term is widely accepted and it's used, it still promotes uh, Spanish heritage, which some people um, are opposed to. Some claim that Hispanic uh, celebrates violent colonization and erasure of indigenous people. So that's something very um, respectful to, to really take into consideration when using these terms. And it's really important to know the historical background of these terms as well. Latinx, however, is a more recent term. It was actually introduced in the early 2000s as a gender neutral alternative to the masculine Latino and the feminine uh, Latina forms. Uh, Latinx is also meant to include those who don't identify as a binary gender and has been widely accepted by the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Latinx did not take off until around 2014, however. And in addition, currently only about 3% of Latinos in the US uh, prefer to use this term for themselves. Um, and when we're talking about ident identity and uh, how we should be referring to our community. I think we're all asking ourselves the question is, well, how does our Northern Nevada uh, community identify? And I know that 
Lisbeth uh, Alvarez was able to give us some of that information and some of this information uh, might be a continued conversation of that, but that is because it's very important. If you took anything away from the previous slide, it's that Hispanic is a term that tells us about language, while Latino is a term that tells us about geography. Because um, I know there's a lot of information being uh, shared, so I thought I'd recap that. In reference to Nevada, the uh, Nevada diversity, Nevada is actually home to a population of about 3.03 million people. The ethnic composition of the population of Nevada is composed of 1.47 million white alone residents, almost 50%. And as Lisbeth mentioned earlier, um, 881,000 residents are Hispanic or Latino, which is almost that 30%, that 28% that Lisbeth talked about. And that's followed by um, African Americans, Asian alone residents, and of course, residents who identify with two or more races. In 2018, however, the most common birth uh, place for foreign residents in Nevada was Mexico. Um, a natal country that actually natal country to almost 231,000 Nevada residents, followed by the Philippines and El Salvador. And that is very important because as you see here on this graph, 53% um, of US Hispanics and Latino actually prefer to identify with the exact country of origin. And well, that still makes Hispanic the most common term. But I think the most important takeaway from here is one, knowing where these terms come from, knowing how long they've been used and getting to know your community individually. And that might seem like a hard job to do, uh, but it's a hard, it's a job that we can all take on um, depending on who we're communicating with. If we're addressing an LGBT community, we know that Latinx is something that is a, of a preference, right? And that's a way of showing respect. Um, we also know that if we're addressing a group of five, we might have the opportunity to take the time to get to know where their country of origin is and in, uh, have them introduce themselves. Like we have mentioned, when you get to share something about yourself, it just opens up the room. Um, but if we're talking into a larger group or to a specific demographic, we might use some of these terms like Hispanic or Latino. The important part is knowing why you're using them. Is it geographic? Is it more of the Spanish speaking community? So having that knowledge, and I know you're all here to gain that knowledge is very impactful. So thank you for doing that. So is Spanish necessary when um, uh, interacting with this community, when doing an attempt to engage to the best uh, that we can? Well, I'll tell you this, um, when translating, when using Spanish, uh, Google Translate, it misses context. And here's the reason why. Um, the most common foreign language spoken in Nevada is Spanish, and that is for more than 606,000 people just in the state of Nevada, for those of us that are joining us here locally and in the state, followed by Tagalog and Chinese and so on. But here are some very helpful tips if you are wanting to translate some of your documents, if you are wanting to reach to this large demographic of 606 or more than 606,000 people. You have to do your research. Always do thorough research, target language and audience. Languages are fluid in their social, cultural, and political environments, they're always shifting, as we know, right? 2020 has been pretty heavy on that. Staying on top of these trends and these changes will always allow you to provide the most accurate and appropriate translation. Your audience, we've talked a lot about audience today, but there's multiple factors to consider. Language, like Spanish, um, it's not the same in any Spanish-speaking region. It must resonate and connect culturally uh, with the exact community that you're trying to reach. The tone and the style. Um, it is crucial that you know uh, who is reading your translation. Pronouns like tú y usted, which is formal and informal, um, are not used the same for different audiences. And you actually want to avoid confusion for intended readers. Idioms. Some idioms must uh, may translate across regions but some may not have any sense whatsoever and have an entirely different meaning. You must focus on meaning. Uh, you've heard that a lot today. And that's where interpretation versus translation plays a good part. Uh, literal translation does not sound natural. 
and it can also be incomprehensive to a target language. So focusing on the interpretation rather than the literal translation will be key uh, when using Spanish. And of course, like anything else, right, proofreading. For proofreading, you can use in-house staff if you have it to assist you with proofreading or even in the editing process. Most likely they will know the cultural and social norms of the language in your area like Northern Nevada. Um, given that our community is heavily Mexican, uh, what is the Spanish that's used in that region? There's a lot to take into consideration. Uh, Spanish isn't just a, a, an overall cover blanket that can be used for all uh, Spanish speaking communities. And if you didn't know that, I hope that this um, uh, PowerPoint and these tips have uh, allowed you to see some of that. And of course, if you don't have that in uh, house staff, hiring, hiring bilingual staff that is knowledgeable and capable of engaging best with the Hispanic community. And again, that is culturally and socially aware of the language itself. So beyond language, how do we best connect? How do we develop relationships by building on to cultural strengths that already exist within our uh, comunidad here in, in, in Nevada? Um, you must communicate with the Hispanic community face to face. It's a very grassroots effort and it works. Personal contact is still the most uh, important way to communicate with Hispanic families. Now, I know you're all thinking uh, we're in COVID, we're all through Zoom right now, we're facing social distancing, but however, we know that innovation has been key in all of our agencies in the last couple months, and I know we can be very innovative in still producing a very grassroots effort around different campaigns. Leveraging key partnerships with prominent leaders, uh, leaders in our local community, Trust is everything in our Hispanic community. So building trust with members of our community who already earned the trust of the Latino community is key. Um, and using your message to convey shared values, such as an importance of familia, family, and providing information of how their family would benefit from their services. Benefit to the buyer, right? We do that in everything. We shouldn't be leaving the Latino community out uh, from seeing the benefit of your service, of your program, of your event, um, and specifically taking their cultural norms into consideration. And of course, look around the community, look for images, common places that are familiar or meaningful um, to the Spanish speaking and the Hispanic uh, audience and use that in a very respectful uh, way when you do an outreach strategy. And of course, outreach through media channels that Hispanics uh, interact with the most, like radio, TV, and Facebook. And we're all using those nowadays uh, uh, still. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of information here. Um, I know a lot of it ha has been repetitive, uh, but it's very important information. And I'd like to just uh, thank you once again for, for being present, being part of this conversation, and hopefully taking some insights on how to better uh, engage with the community. Um, if you still have questions, we're happy to answer them. I'm happy to answer them at the, at the end of this. So just make sure to continue to put those on the Q&A. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. That was a really good information. And I know, you know, that talking about terms and how to label, you know, the Latino community, Hispanic community, it, it is an emotionally charged topic, you know, and um, it, it, it does, you know, open up these conversations about what the preferred term is, and it, it really depends on region, you know, and generation. And I was speaking to, um, to the speakers, uh, to be redundant, about how they identify themselves. And myself, Lisbeth, uh, Jay Diego, and Erika, we identify as Latino, Latina, that's our preferred term. And that's the term that we have been using uh, when we are doing um, any campaign outreach. Um, but as you know, the other uh, information that we received from the Pew uh, Research, um, Hispanic Research Center, sorry, I might, might be cutting that off, the name of the organization. Um, they, you know, obviously found that Hispanic is still, you know, one of the preferred terms over Latino, but that's what we will, uh, the guidance that we will uh, let you know about that. And um, I also wanted to touch upon something else that Diego spoke about, which is family. You know, family is very important uh, to the Latino community. And there's this phrase that I, a term that I just learned recently, it's a uh, familismo. Um, I knew about the concept, but it has a word <laughs> to it. And it's a, uh, it's a cultural value within the Latino community. It really involves around dedication and loyalty to the family. Um, a lot of the, one of the cultural values here in the United States is a lot about being independent, think for yourself, be your own person. And so as you could see, those two cultural values, um, do clash. Um, 
um, in, in a sense. And you know, a lot of people who are, are now immigrants to the United States or who are born to immigrant uh, parents have to kind of find a way to, um, to you know, have that, that and kind of living in those both worlds, right? Where family is, is number one, you know, you seek your family for decisions, but you also have, you know, the American value of being very independent. And the reason I, I, I bring that up is, um, we do have a great speaker next, who's Erika Aviles, who will be talking about a COVID-19 um, uh, campaign that they launched in Southern Nevada. And it really goes into that part about knowing how important family is to this community, because a lot of the campaigns that we've seen around COVID-19 is about self-responsibility. Like, you wear a mask, you, you know, it's, and it's, it's a lot of that. And when you're speaking to the Latino community, it's like, do it for your family. It's, 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 you know, it's talking about that, that cultural value that we have. And so um, without much further ado, then I'm gonna you know, tell you a little bit more about Erica. Um, Erica, you know, she was born in El Salvador. Um, and, and, and I mentioned before she identifies as Latina, but if you ask her, she, she's you know, Salvadorian American and she's proud to say that too. And you know, she immigrated as a refuge here with her parents uh, at six. Um, you know, her, you know, one of her biggest accomplishments at a young age was learning the language. Um, and she went on to be the first in her family to graduate from high school and college. And she's really done a really great job at distinguishing herself uh, with a lot of experience. Um, she's, you know, been awarded the Rising Star Award by the Las Vegas Hospitality Association, a women of distinction in the tourism industry, and also uh, recognized by a Las Vegas newspaper as a Hispano Destacado or Distinguished Hispanic. And Arika Aviles, uh, main folk consulting, um, LLC's main focus is connecting, engaging local businesses and government organizations with the Hispanic and Latin, Latin American community markets, um, as both you know local and also international. Uh, you know, prior to doing this business, Erica also held um, high profile high-profile position within the travel and tourism industry, uh, including the Las Vegas Convention Tourism. And thank you so much, Erica, for being here today. And, you know, we've received all this information about, you know, how to reach the Latino community. And so I thought it would be great to give, you know, and um, our, you know, have our last speaker give us an example of what a great outreach um, event looks like and why not do it around COVID since it's so uh, timely. So Erica, thank you so much. Buenas tardes. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Okay, the plan was to be outside doing this since we got very cool in Las Vegas terms this morning, pero I think it's 100 degrees, so I brought it back indoors. But um, gracias, Yvette. We miss you in Las Vegas, as you know, but it's great to connect with everyone. Great to connect with everyone up north. And I was quickly taking a look at our participant list and see a lot of my friends and community partners and um, the village that it has taken to put this campaign together because it has really, uh, I've been the point person, but it has really been a Southern Nevada village effort to make this happen um, and kick this off into the community. Um, is my presentation up? I can only see, okay, perfect, okay. Um, so, um, está en tus manos Nevada, which translates to it's in your hand. So, um, real quick, if I go back to the first one, because I, I just want to touch on a little bit of the background. Um, probably in late, sometime in mid-June, it's kind of this summer has been a blur. All I know is I received a call or a text from someone saying, we need you on this Hispanic Latino task force with uh, Commissioner Marilyn Kirkpatrick here with Clark County. We need to do a campaign and she needs to talk to everybody. And let's just say um, I have the utmost respect for that woman, for this woman, but it was not a pleasant conversation because it was all alarms ring red. Our numbers are going up in the Latino community. They're really bad um, at that time our positivity rate for COVID was twice, uh, two to one in terms of the Hispanics to the white population here in Clark County. And it was really at that time, and I was thinking about it, you know, this morning and preparing for this, it really is, uh, initially it's having those leaders, having those people who are gonna ring that alarm, who are gonna ring, you know, and, and put notice, put the community on notice that what are we doing to engage with the Hispanic community? And I put on the slide outreach and engagement. Uh, if, you know, a, a lot of people, we, we use the terms loosely, but you know, my, the definition or how I define it, 
outreach is really a one-way uh, approach, right? We're going to table events. We're going to go distribute flyers. It's just a one touch point. Let's just get the message out. And it's really so much more than outreach. It's really the engagement aspect, right? Building those relationships, building those partnerships, and really engaging with the community that you're trying to serve and in an authentic manner. And I think when we, you know, when we went into this uh, Estantus Manos campaign is how do we put together this campaign and kudos to the village and the team. And, and I want to make sure to give credit where it's due. And when we get to that point, um, because it was really, you know, we put this campaign together uh, in less than two weeks. Um, so this was a mid June conversation by July 1st, we were launching a press conference at the Clark County Chambers. It was the first press conference that I recall in a long time that we've also done in both English and Spanish. Uh, and in terms of what everybody, you know, said previously, right, how we really need to get this message out to the community, a unified community message in their language with content that we know is going to resonate with them. Uh, and since then, I mean, we're still working on the campaign. Uh, obviously, you know, COVID is still impacting our our state, our communities, and it's really making sure that we keep the community top of mind with what's going on. So next uh, slide, Yvette, please. Um, in terms of campaign goals, you know, it was, we had to be realistic, um, right, with, with our goals. It's, it's really hard, and I think about, you know, I, I did see my parents this weekend, which we have been maintaining distancing. It's hard to tell your family, no te puedo dar un abrazo, un beso, I can't hug you, I can't kiss you, right? It's, it's so, you know, we're trying to change a culture uh, because it's so much, you know, uh, of that is, is the family, is the face-to-face, -face, is the personal interactions as Diego was mentioning. So it was really for us, right, is it was creating awareness about the importance of getting tested um, in terms of goals. It was, you know, educating the community, right, and the importance of prevention um and what we need to do as well as wraparound services uh, as you know here in southern nevada so much of our industry is impacted or it works in the hospitality industry and it was you know we worked different shifts different times different messaging this was a, a unified cohesive message to our community saying here is what we want to get across to you um, and where you go and get this information so thanks to, to the team, and I know he's on here. Um, he's my, my partner in crime in this, um, Edgar uh, FEO with Grafica. Um, him and his team did an incredible job with in the, in the concepts. And in, it was really looking at this from an integrated marketing component, right? Um, next slide, Yvette. In terms of what do we want to do? How do we, you know, the, the campaign is funded by Clark County, but the message is out to all of Southern Nevada. And I think, you know, for everybody on the call, right, I, I've seen uh, in other campaigns or other messaging, right, well, let's just do PR or let's just do, you know, we'll do this one grassroots outreach effort. It's very piece by piece, you know, and it's not cohesive, right? And it was really for us working together with all of the teams, working together with the different agencies, you know, obviously here, Southern Nevada Health District, Clark County, the local jurisdictions, uh, our internal, my agency, r and partners has been integral with this as well. Um, Grafica is really, okay, how do, we, how do we get this message across and looking at these different outlets? Um, so really, right, with, you know, in terms of, um, we initially, our idea initially was let's just create a landing page, a splash page with some general information. And I invite everyone to go on the website afterwards and, and visit it on our Facebook. We put together and launched a comprehensive um, website, Están Tus Manos, with testing, uh, with, with blogs, with content, with uh, picture gallery, for really the community to make it a one-stop shop, per se, of here is where you go when you have a question or concern about testing, right? And we made sure everything that we did supported the efforts, made sure that they met you know, looking back at our goals, right? It's, this is about a campaign about prevention and awareness. Um, at that time, when we first started, our challenge was also too, um, there was not enough testing sites uh, in East Las Vegas here where a lot of our high population, uh, our red zones were, for example. 
And, you know, and that was where it was really putting together, um, right, who are the people who, all of the different agencies and kind of back to looking at your leadership, looking at your external partners is who are we ringing those alarms to? Because if we're not speaking up, sometimes it, nothing's going to be done. Um, so it was really bringing everybody and have a seat at the table. How do we get this out? And kudos, you know, to Clark County Health District, UMC, our local jurisdictions, because initially we didn't have those sites. Then we kicked off those sites. And then it was, um, you know, now that people are coming to those sites and schools, churches, um, working within those different, making testing available where people felt safe and felt that they knew that location to go and get tested. Um, and it was really looking at all of these, these different components. Um, yeah, go ahead, Yvette. Um, and in terms of just, you know, campaign highlights. So we kicked off the campaign July 1st. Um, and really, you know, están tus manos, it's in your hands. What we saw is we have to give people the power that it's in our hands to control, um, to get tested, to find out information, to spread the message, you know, to the community. Um, and really, you know, if you go on, it's really have, you know, has been consistent in terms of what we're doing social media, what we're doing advertising. Um, again, just go on our, any of our socials. Um, and really, you know, it's, it's daily, you know, probably, a, yeah, da daily content, right? We kicked off, you know, 4th of July holiday, right? We did video uh, about, right, we're, we're Latinos, but we're part of this country, right? But we have to take care of our country. We have to take care of our community, um, taking care of our family. So you see a lot of the demographic, right? And, and what we saw too here in Southern Nevada, a lot of our younger adults were the ones, um, younger adults within the Latino Hispanic community. So making sure again, that we were messaging with them, that we were working with them. And, you know, here, as I'm sure, you know, within in Northern Nevada, we're very, a lot of, um, a lot of households, you know, multi-generational, right? So it's my parents that may live with my sister or just, three different generations, you know, possibly of home. So making sure that we were developing content for each of the generations. And I know with, with Edgar um, and, and the rest of the team, it was really every week and we're still, you know, we were just on a call with Clark County today. Um, we have brought in 60,000 new testing test, tests uh, into the Valley. So how are we gonna disseminate that information to make sure that the community gets tested? literally since we started this campaign every week there's been a different um, message being added to it whether okay now we have testing now we have this wraparound resource service about rental assistance program now we have you know uh, here are the the symptoms or here it's it's really and i you know i think I, to everybody on the call it's it's you can't just do a let's just do a one post a week or let's do a one one off it's really you have to make sure that you're being consistent with the content with the message that it's relative with with, with what is going on in your community um, at that time and what and that it's meeting you know your campaign goals and efforts um so you know i mean it's been in terms of um working with our partners right this is a a paid advertising um, component, but also, you know, working with our media partners. I saw Rodrigo here with Lotus broad Broadcasting. So what can we do in terms of donated PSAs? What can we do in terms of, you know, additional added value elements is working with all of our partners and, and having a sense, right? If you, if you know your community partners, having a sense of where they bring value because that's what you, you want to know. You want to make it easier for them to be able to execute on what that ask is. Um, and, you know, moving into that with, we developed this Hispanic task force. Um, so the impressions of getting people to the testing sites has been phenomenal. Getting people to have that trust and that confianza, the confidence. Because here, you know, either people were, there was a lot of just misinformation or not enough information. Do I, need, uh, do I need to be a U.S. resident to go get tested? Do, am I gonna be asked for my social security? Am I gonna be asked, you know, what are those questions? So it was really educating the community on what the process looked like um, and working with all the different agencies. You know, with UMC, it was one thing, with Southern Nevada Health District, uh, with City of Las Vegas. So we formed this task force and back to my uh, original call when this kicked off, 
um, you know, Clark County gave us the, the reins to say, who do we need? We need the workers, we need the doers. Who's gonna help us get this word out? And right now we have been talking initially at the start of the campaign, we were talking every day and more than 40 people were showing up from our community. Um, since then, we've been talking every week. Um, here are your action items, here are the deliverables, here's where we're at with the campaign, here's what we need your help with. So it's being clear on your expectations, but having, you know, and I think for us is we all have that rapport in that community um, to bring the right people to the table that you know are gonna get the job done and that are gonna help take this message further out. Um, so you see Senator Cortez Masto was on our calls. It's kind of become now a, um, it is a family, you know, and everybody's like, okay, what are we gonna do? How do we keep this family together after this campaign? Because it's, it's become, you know, there's tears that have been shed by me personally, um, by the community of, hey, here's where we're at. Here is why we need to care about this. And at the end, it's really special to me, one of our faith leaders, so this task force it's made up of our supermarket partners, elected officials, uh, faith leaders. Um, I think I saw Yusef here from Chase Bank, you know, private corporate organizations. It's people that care and right, whatever your campaign, you know, your team, it's you wanna find the people that care that are gonna wanna get that message out and have the right intention. Tell me if I'm, going, if I'm talking too much, Yvette, but uh, I'm just very passionate about it, about the task force. Um, at the end, I was, I was going to add, um, we have uh, Padre Rafael, who's with All Saints Episcopal Church. At the end now of every one of our meetings, he does a prayer for us. And it's just, you know, there's no task force like this, and I'm so proud of it, and of all of the people that have come together and all of the work. And it's really, again, having the right people at the table, making sure their voices are heard and that you're communicating with them daily. Um, recently, we launched, you know, with, with the team, this Estantos Manos video, right? We were making sure the message resonated, but also, you know, it's a tough time for our community, especially, you know, all of our communities are Hispanic, Latino community as well. So we were like, how do we have some, you know, how do we try to have some fun around such a very tough time for our community, right? But still getting the message across of Estantos Manos. So, we put together this great spot. Hopefully it works for you. Um, I said I wanted that to be the song of the summer. I'm still working on that. <laughs> um, and on that note, you know, it's really our next phase of this campaign is working with micro influencers in our community, right? So you saw there's a component here, a dance component. So we're looking on TikTok, on Instagram, who in the young adult audience has these platforms that could continue to make that message resonate. The lequitos means like from a distance, from far away. So it's, you know, while still keeping the, it's in our hands, right? So it's in our hands. We're all in this together, but we all got to put in, you know, we all got to make it work. So um, I hope you like that video. Uh, to recap, uh, in terms of just campaign must-haves, and I think key lessons learned for us, uh, Yvette, next slide, um, is just making sure, again, you know, you want your campaign to be authentic. You want to be doing it for the right reasons. You want to have, um, you know, engaging in language. For us, it was very important to reach our Spanish-speaking community because that message was not getting out to them. Um, you want to make it easy for them to access. So whether it was on our Facebook channel, on our Facebook page, people can message us. We have the bot. People can message us on our website as well and ask questions. And we're getting all sorts of questions, but we're directing them 
I think I saw Rosa here from 211, right? Who are those other community partners that if we don't have the answers, we can point them to the right, uh, right place? Um, community support, you know, and, and I think this campaign has only been successful because of the community jumping all in and saying, yes, we need, we all care about this, this is it impacting? Um, I think I saw Saida here from La Bonita Supermarket. So when we did our campaign uh, press conference, we had Mr. Wow, who is my favorite person in all of Las Vegas. He was our spokesperson, you know, for that. And he deliver, delivered such a powerful message of it's in our hands. We have to be able to stop this and, and get these resources going. So it's having that community support. But to get to that point, you have to have that trust in those relationships. Because I, I truly believe if we would not have had these partnership relationships and places uh, ready, we would not have been able to mobilize this as quickly as possible. And you know, key, the, uh, key lessons learned, daily communication. We started a WhatsApp group uh, within the task force here. Every day we send them updates. Here's where we're at with testing. Here is some breaking information um, and, and making sure you're keeping them engaged because all of our task force all of our community, I'm sure as your communities, we're being asked of a lot right now. So you wanna make it as easy as for them to be able to execute and act upon. Um, you know, and again, testing in terms of messaging. So we would show with our task force or within smaller groups, does this resonate? What do you think about this creative? Is this gonna work, right? And making sure again, this, that this was culturally um, acceptable. And, and all of the team working on this, you know, yo soy salvadoreña, uh, Edgar is peruano, J-Lo, we have our own J-Lo here in Southern Nevada, is Mexicana, it's, it's really, right, making sure that we were testing it and that the message worked and also adapting and being flexible. As I said earlier, I mean, every week our message has been a little bit different in terms of what that call to action is, right? Is it testing, wraparound resources? Um, you know, t tomorrow or as of next week, it's we have a new testing site in East Las Vegas, we got to get people there. Um, so it's just being flexible, I think, in, in your approach, in your component and having the right people at the table. So um, I'll end it at that if anybody has any questions, but um, feel free to go on the website, uh, Están Tus Manos, you can see all of the content, uh, the Facebook page and, and to give you some inspiration. So. Thank you, Yvette. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erika. So please, you know, if you have any questions, go ahead and um, put the, drop it down in the Q&A. Um, we have a couple questions already here. Um, we spoke about the terms Hispanic and Latino, and it was an earlier question. Um, I believe we covered that one. And trans creation, Lizbeth, you mentioned that during your presentation. Could you go over um, what is trans creation? Yeah, of course. Um, when comparing it to direct translation, and De Diego spoke on this topic a little bit, how Google Translate, you miss the mark, you miss the message, you um, are translating, and it means something completely different in Spanish, or um, you want to translate a phrase, and it, it doesn't necessarily fit, and it's something, you know, that's completely the opposite. With trans creation, you, you create something specifically for that demographic. So for the Latino community, you know, you wouldn't just go off the regular strat the, the strategy that you already have for the white population. You would create your own strategy, um, the, own ta the tactics that you're gonna use for that audience, um, the messaging is gonna be different. And like I said, it's not just gonna be with this, you know, Spanish or, or using Spanish or code switching, but it's actually like tying it into the culture. So you're, you're technically just creating, you know, an entire, you know, specific strategy for that group. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Emily, for that um, question. I have one here. Um, Erika, maybe you can give us an, an example. Um, Consider the COVID-19 and social distancing restrictions. Um, what have you found or some of the, maybe, you know, give us a specific example of how um, the best way that you've seen has been the the best way to outreach to do outreach to this community are the ones you I mean you're doing a lot right it's a very integrated um yeah. plan you have which one would you think is you know the best way would you say um well right now through some of our uh I'll go back to some of Mariana's and La Bonita supermarkets so we develop we're in the process right now of developing printed pieces 
that we have that partnership with them that they will be able to put the printed pieces of all of the testing sites in the grocery bags for the community. Um, in addition, um, they have, you know, find out who has like digital assets um, that they could donate space or there is, you have a budget, a paid component. Because with them, you know, they created their own PSAs within the store, um, as well as digital assets, they donated space to put our creative on there. So I think it's kind of on, on the digital front, but it's still at a grassroots level. Who are your businesses? Who are your organizations? But I think you would have, you would want to establish some sort of rapport or relationship before you go out to them and say, can you give me this? You know, it, it's really... And I, you know, to Lisbeth's point about the strategy and the planning, this is a great time if your agency or your organization doesn't have a plan, you gotta start somewhere, right? Cause it's putting a plan in place of what does 2021 look like for you? And it sounds like you have all the right people in Northern Nevada. And who are those people you wanna build that relationship to Diego's point and, and, and put that plan in place because you, you don't want a pandemic to be the first time to be like, okay, well, we need to do outreach. Um, you need to have those relationships and those partners in place. If you don't, you, now is a good time to start. Great, thank you so much. And it looks like we have another question for you too. Um, are there any plans, thank you, uh, Jackie, uh, for this question. Are there any plans to take that, um, the, the Southern Nevada campaign to take it statewide at this moment? <laughs> Um, I don't know, Yvette. Uh, Lisbeth, you may know more about that than I do. I, I do only know it is for Southern Nevada at this point. But, you know, I think a lot of some of our friends I know, Yvette, have seen it in Northern Nevada. Um, we just got to pose it to the right people, I think, um, and make sure we're, we're being heard. If, if, it's, if it's not being done, I think it is in the process of something done in, be, uh, in Washoe County. But, um, that's as far as I know right now. We do have one more question about um, how, I don't know if you have gone to this point yet. I know a lot of it's about, you know, using the mask and doing social distancing. Um, how would you recommend about maybe talking about vaccines? Are you guys there yet? Or have you had any initial um, conversations about that? About a vaccine for COVID or just vaccine? Uh, I know we, from a PR perspective, we are talking about it. We're talking, and, and I think that's where we look to the leadership as well with the health district and UMC to make sure um, to make sure we're following their lead because I am by no means a medical professional. Um, so I know it's we we have a call weekly with the health district to see where we're at in that process and making sure that we're we're getting ready. Um, if it is that for now, you know, it's, it's making sure if somebody does ask that question that we at least have some sort of answer. If somebody asks on Facebook, on the website, that you have some pre-programmed, you know, whether you don't have an answer now, but making sure that you, you know, you do your, you prep in advance and do your homework in advance so that when it is time, and I know we, you know, we are talking about it, um, and I'm happy to share once that is out, you know, or just sign up or follow us and you'll see, you know, once we get that message out. Great. Thank you so much. And then thank you, Jackie, for those questions. We also had here um, an anonymous comment about, you know, the double standard about, you know, the trending nopales and hitting children. And I think, you know, the, the, the big message, you know, the, the message here is, you know, advising, you know, people on the cultural connections with the public, um, you know, and how to do it appropriately. And it was not about you know, getting children, you know, and it's, it's really about understanding the culture. And, um, you know, it, this was just an example of a baseball name that, you know, resonated with the Latino community. And, um, you know, it, it, it is controversial, but it did, you know, resonate with the community and made it one of the top uh, ones uh, community here. So um, thank you so much for, for that comment. I'd love to engage um, after this if, if there's any follow up questions surrounding that. Um, and Lucy, it looks like I don't, since I'm sharing my, my screen, I'm not able to see the comments, unfortunately, but it looks like there's some questions over there that Lucy will take care for us. Thank you so much. We had a couple. Um, one is from Claudia Cruz. What is the best medium or platform to reach Latinos in Reno, Northern Nevada? Radio, TV, Instagram, do we know? Um, I guess we can open it up to all the panelists if any of you have an answer to that or I think it may have been asked during Elizabeth's presentation. I think Diego um, um, touched upon it a little bit in his, um, if you want to talk about it again, that'd be great. 
Yeah, most definitely. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Yvette. Um, we definitely talked, Claudia, about a television and radio, and we have quite a few radio stations here in town. Uh, in regards to Instagram, I would say that Facebook is a lot uh, heavier used by the Latino community, especially the older uh, demographic. Um, so I hope that that answers your question. But uh, I know we mentioned that grassroots efforts face to face and just being innovative. I know Erica uh, has mentioned quite a few ways that you can still continue to do that. But because of COVID, we're heavily focused on the social media platforms and using radio and TV at the moment. Yeah, on, on that note too, I would add um, for our campaign, we segmented within the Hispanic community. So our first target audience was uh, Hispanic males because that's who we found were not, at that time was wearing a face mask. And there was a stereotype and there still could be that males, Hispanic males did not want to wear um, face masks, right? And then it was young adults and moms. So even within, you know, taking it a step further and segmenting that within that Hispanic population, how would you reach them? Gotcha, okay. Well, um, I think we have one or two more questions. Um, Allison asked, how do you suggest checking for cultural appropriateness if you don't have Latino, Latina, or Latinx staff to, to look to? Um, at some, I, if I, I could jump in on there. Um, I, I speak Spanish, you know, I'm, I'm bilingual, but sometimes I need to, somebody to bounce it off of, right? So I will send it to a couple of friends. So if you have friends in your, in your community, like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, there should be no fear or shame and saying, does this, what do you think, you know, does this resonate? And I think we appreciate the community appreciates like that you're asking their input, whether it is a one-off, you know, person or someone, you know, if you have like a, I believe the chamber's up there joint, but like, who is that, some, you know, is it Councilman Delgado or Lisbeth or, you know, reaching out to you, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think, Go ahead. sorry, Lucy. Um, Erica, I think that's like exactly what I do. If I'm working on something and I want to know that I'm not having unconscious bias uh, based on my experiences or what I believe in, I will share with someone else or a couple people to see what their reaction is, mm -hmm. um, to see where I can improve. Um, and we do that at KPS3 and it's real, and we bounce it off each other and we try to figure out, you know, where the common ground is so that we both, um, you know, can, can reach that point where we're comfortable with the messaging um, and it's, you know, still specific to that audience. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up to that same question, um, she says, obviously hiring more POC as staff is important. Do you recommend a blind resume where names are not identifiable for hiring practices? I guess that would mean like if you're relaying resumes from HR and Things like well, that. I mean, I, I think if, and sorry to jump on this, I think if we're having to take away names, maybe we should be looking at the hiring staff and doing more diversity and inclusion efforts there in regards to training, because that shouldn't make a difference. But most definitely, there should be an effort to hire more people of color, uh, more bilingual people, as we intend to reach out to this community specifically. Yeah. And I, I see a question, I, 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 if I could add, I think Victor about bringing this beyond Hispanic Heritage Month and to Diego's point about diversity and inclusion, I found myself on a Zoom call uh, talking about diversity and inclusion and I was the only Latina on the call. Everybody else was white women. And, you know, in terms of any plans, you know, for back to the subject of this, bringing this beyond Hispanic Heritage Month, it's, I per take personal ownership, right? And when I am in these conversations uh, to follow up with the organizer afterwards, right? Uh, you know, or have sometimes uncomfortable situ uncomfortable conversations, but conversations, especially now that need to be had. Um, so I just wanted, I saw that comment. So I wanted to share that. I think Erica, to piggyback off on that, this, this is a call uh, for action for a lot of us that uh, we're all here to, become leaders in one way or another, whether if you're a student, whether if you're in a leadership position at an organization or have some sort of inclusion 
with community efforts or school districts, uh, having this conversation is important. Uh, being able to engage with the overall community, and we know that the Hispanic community has been overseen for so long, and sometimes it's just Hispanic Heritage Month, right? So we're calling all of you to be leaders and to have these conversations, which sometimes could be uncomfortable, but they're conversations that need to be had. And um, I think that's very important. So thank you for the question, Big Book. Yeah, and I know that diversity and inclusion across the board is a priority for PRSA National and as well as PRSA Sierra Nevada. So we are looking to include more conversations like this, whether it's related directly to the Hispanic Latino community or other communities of color, minorities. And we definitely look forward to continuing um, this learning experience. Yeah, and if we don't have any more questions there on the chat, I want to thank everybody so much. And um, I read something, it was on my uh, Facebook feed um, earlier this week, and it said, diversity is being invited, you know, to a party. Um, inclusion is being asked to dance. And equality is being on the party planning committee. And so um, I really love that example. And I think, you know, it'd be great um, to incorporate it, you know, into our, our plans. I think that's how you're really going to get success out of this Latino um, outreach. And I want to thank everybody um, who joined us today. Um, like I said, you know, there's people who have already um, done some outreach, people who haven't at all. And, you know, I hope that you get out of this uh, event today is to do it, to try it and um, to ask questions. Uh, Elizabeth, J. Diego, Erika, and myself are available. And, you know, uh, some of the things that we, we discussed today, you know, like titles and certain um, items that, you know, resonate with our culture, they are, you know, can be, you know, controversial or, you know, they are emotionally driven. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what it is. You, you know, when you're living in this community, you understand it and it will resonate for some and it will resonate for others. And so, um, again, thank you so much. I don't know if anybody else wants to do any of the other closing thoughts? Um, the big message for today is, you know, reaching the Latino community beyond Hispanic Heritage Month. And so hopefully you will incorporate, you will be um, reaching this community every, you know, all year, every year, um, and not just during this next month. Um, Hispanic Heritage Month does start um, on the 15th. Um, I will say though that um, Hispanic Heritage Month was something that's very important to me. Why? Because when I was growing up and without having knowledge that I have today, um, it was the only that one month that I was like, oh my, like I would see people that look like me, people who, you know, allowed me to be like, I do have a, a seat at the table. And so, you know, the, the Hispanic Heritage Month is, you know, was a great start. Um, but now I think it's time to move where we do this all, all the time. And all, we have a very diverse table. And so thanks again, everybody. And on behalf of the PRSA Sierra Nevada chapter, um, thank you for joining us today. And we hope to have more events like this. So thank you.